Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Film Theatre and the Guardian students and teenagers. Since he began his career in the early 50s, he's been responsible for more innovations in the making, marketing and distribution of films than most of us have bought film tickets. As the co-founder of American International Pictures, he was the spiritual midwife to the talents of Francis Coppola, Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen and Roger Corman to name but four. Working with him encouraged filmmakers to think on their feet. Twelve-day shooting schedules, budgets counted in thousands rather than millions, some sets used time and time again. AIP's first film was Fast and Furious, and that's as good a way as any to describe the filmmaking philosophy of AIP. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the man who put the teenage into titles, who turned B's into A's, the emperor of low tech, Samuel Z. Arkoff. Uh, welcome, uh, fellow film buffs. Uh, I'm delighted to be over here. Actually, I've been in England many times, having produced or co-produced about 40 pictures in England. And I will tell you that making pictures in the UK is just as difficult and hazardous as making them at home. And I don't know how many times in those 40 pictures over here that I got a rush call, had to leave the office in Los Angeles and take the night plane only to get off at 8 o'clock the next morning, which was 12 o'clock Los Angeles time, ready for sleep to find the crisis people right there at the plane to meet me. I'll tell you, there were there was many a day when you would go through without any sleep, work until 6 o'clock at night, have a couple of cocktails with a group, and then go home, go, go back to the hotel and go to sleep. In any event, I'm delighted to be here. I do want to take exception to one comment my friend has made. He called me a legend. Now, by my books, a legend is somebody who's horizontal. I may not be very tall, but I'm still vertical. Uh, actually, you may be interested in knowing how does anybody as obviously sane as I am get into an insane business. And this is how it goes. When I was 14, I came from a little town in Iowa, and I went to the Chicago World's Fair and ran across a copy of Variety, the show business trade paper. It had a strange vernacular of its own and I was attracted. Went back to Fort Dodge, nobody knew anything about Variety, got the man who ran the pool hall to bring in a copy every week, and every week I paid 15 cents and got the Variety. And I decided I wanted to be in the picture business. I didn't know how, I knew I wasn't an actor, didn't think I was a writer or a director, but I thought this is what I want to do. When I got out of the Army Air Force in the no November of 1945 and got married to uh, the girl I met on a blind date, who was sitting out there still, uh, and came out to Los Angeles to go to law school. While I was still in law school, I had ran into another chap I had met during the service who'd been in radio. And he was interested in television which was then an experimental medium. This is in the late 40s. And he had the idea to make television on film, and I helped him. Uh, I was accommodating, and I was cheap. I didn't get anything. But between the money that the government gave me to go to school and between my wife, who had a wonderful job, I did very well. In any event, we made this little film television show. It was called The Hank McCune Show after my partner there, and we made it for practically nothing, radio people trying to get experienced in television and so on, and several years later we managed to land a contract and we were the first NBC comedy film show. Three years later uh, I met Jim Nicholson. Now you have to recognize the period of the 50s for what it was. It was the period that television took over and the motion picture theater and motion picture production went into the drain. 
Thousands of theaters closed. As a matter of fact, during the 1950s, 7,000 theaters in the United States closed out of 21,000. The same thing, I think even to a little greater extent, happened in England. Why? Because the young marrieds, the middle-aged and the old people sat at home, particularly in the United States in the new homes that were being built, uh, and watched television. And the only audience that went to the theaters were the young people. Why? First of all, they had to get out of the house, and in the second place, the parents wanted to get them out of the house. By this time, the depression was over, the parents had money, they gave it to the kids, the kids were out getting jobs in fast food places and so on. So this was the audience. So Jim Nicholson and I figured this was a good time to get in business. Our only problem was that we didn't have any money. But we had a plan. And the plan was to make pictures for teenagers using teenagers. Nobody else was taking care of them. The major still hadn't realized, for some reason, that the teenagers were the ones really going to pictures. And as a consequence, what they had were the same old stars who'd virtually grown old in the business. The stars like uh, Norma Scherer and, and Joan Crawford and uh, Greer Garson and so on. Great stars, perhaps. But by now, they were in their late 40s. Some of them were even in their 50s. And the teenagers were going to see these movies and saying of Joan Crawford, for example, who always played a shop girl or a waitress or somebody like that, although she always lived in an enormous apartment and obviously must have been doing night work as well <laughs> to be able to afford the apartment. But they said, my God, she's older than my mother. How could she play somebody their age? We knew this was true. We thought this was, this, and this was our plan. Our, of course, our problem was how to raise the money. So what happened was we managed to raise it. We found a English uh, producer distributor, Nat Cohen, who gave us, I think, $12,000 as an advance on every picture. We found a laboratory in the United States that would do our upfront laboratory work on credit would give us the final prints on credit and would give us $25,000 a picture besides as a loan. And by that means, we managed to raise anywhere from the $29,000 to the $100,000 a picture that we needed. And, but we did have a plan in order to conserve money. The first one was we were not going to make any picture that we didn't feel had a chance at an audience. The big problem with most major companies then and now is a production department makes the picture, doesn't talk to anybody else, and when the picture is done, they go into the head of distribution and say, here's our picture, sell it. And after he's out of the door, the head of distribution says, how? The fact is, we started then with a title. Now, Jim Nicholson was the greatest title man I have ever met. He used to go home at night, do a little thinking, and he would come up the next morning, he'd say, Sam, what do you think of the title, I Was a Teenage Werewolf? I would think, you know, I would really be startled. I would say, my God, that's a million dollar title going on a hundred thousand dollar picture. <laughs> you see, there had never been any pictures in the whole history of filmdom up to that time that had the word teenager in the title. We were aiming at teenagers. I was a teenage werewolf. In many respects, then we did I Was a Teenage Frankenstein. We did Teenage Caveman. In many respects, I Was a Teenage Werewolf or Frankenstein was not a hell of a lot difference in basic plots to the basic Draculas and Frankenstein that Universal made in the 30s. The difference was the protagonist in this case was always a teenager, whereas in the Dracula and Frankenstein picture that wasn't true. The antagonist, the villain, of course, was always an adult in our pictures, uh, whether it was a horror picture or a youth picture or anything of that particular kind. So we got the title, then we did the rough artwork because we wanted to put the title and the rough artwork together, and then we would have high school students going out to high schools, college students going out to colleges, and we would also talk to a half a dozen 
people in advertising or otherwise that we thought, you know, knowledgeable. We didn't talk to exhibitors much because exhibitors then and now have one similarity. All their showmanship goes into their candy counter. Uh, I trust there's some exhibitors in the audience. In any event, when we had a good response after all of that research, then we went ahead and we wrote the script and we made the picture. And that basically was the way it was done. Then, of course, we had the good luck to run into Roger Corman. Roger was a singularly interesting individual. He had, uh, Roger couldn't help himself. He always wanted to save money. <laughs> In fact, in some cases, he was known as being extremely cheap. And sometimes when he'd be out on the road and we would see the first day's rushes, we would call up Roger and say, Roger, extras are cheap, fill in the background. And Roger would do it. The first picture that we had handled was Fast and Furious. Uh, and unfortunately for us, it played as a second feature. In the United States in those days, also in the UK, there was double feature territory. But for a second feature, <clears throat> you only got a flat price, not very big, whereas it was the top feature that got the percentage. So we discovered after three pictures that the exhibitors were playing our pictures as second features for a flat price and playing the major's picture for the percentage. So we said, nothing doing. We are not going to be able to get by this way. And so therefore we decided to make two pictures on the same subject, put them together, and be able to get a percentage. Now one of the first pictures that came out that way was Beast with a Million Eyes. Now this is a great title of Jim's, and we had a great piece of artwork. And it came on Roger's fourth picture, and there was only $29,000 left. Unfortunately, the weather had been bad on one of the pictures, and the picture had gone over, and all Roger had left was 29000 So we said to him, Roger, here's a great idea, here's a great title, go out and make it. He said, I, I know I'm cheap, but I don't know how I can make it for $29,000. I said, Roger, we know you can do it. So he, he didn't go to the Screen Actors Guild, he didn't go to the craft unions, he just went out on the desert near Palm Springs, didn't take credit on the picture, by the way, as a director. And he shot the picture, brought it into us, and then he went off to shoot another picture. Now, we edited the picture, which was very common in Roger's case, because making four pictures a year, both producing and directing, he obviously couldn't wait for the picture to be fully edited. And we get done with the editing, and we find there is no beast. Now, how can you release a picture called a beast with a million eyes if you don't have a beast? Finally, we called up Roger, we said, Roger, we must have mislaid the footage. Where is the beast footage? He said, I didn't shoot it. He said, I didn't have the money, I didn't have the time. You put in the monster. So what we finally did is we took a tea kettle, we put about 50 holes in it, and the steam that we ran through it obscured the thing, and this became the beast with a million eyes. This is a method of showing you that uh, Ingenuity can take the place of money. Then we went into uh, The Day the World Ended, which was really our first hit, along with The Phantom from 10,000 Leagues, which was the accompanying feature that would make the package. Now, The Day the World Ended was an early picture of its type, was later copied many times by Spielberg and many others. Uh, what happened was that you had an atomic attack. You have Three, peop three basic people. You have a girl, her lover, and her brother. They go out in the open, and the lover and the girl and the lover duck behind the big rock, for whatever purposes, and the brother is out in the open. Along comes an atomic attack, and the brother is affected by it, and is immediately metamorphosized into a three-eyed monster who's seven feet tall. Now this is completely believable under certain scientific circumstances. <laughs> the lover and her, her brother are behind a rock, aren't affected at all. So she comes out, you know, she's feeling a little dirty, I guess, after the attack. 
And so she is bathing in this uh, waterfall. We shot this picture uh, at a restaurant near our house that had a pond where I used to take my kids down and you'd catch fish and then the restaurant would cook the fish. So, you know, we made a deal to use this waterfall. So the monster comes over and she sees him and faints and he picks her up and carries her off. Well, okay, so we have to have a monster. Now this is, today, your special effects are state of the art. Spielberg spent millions of dollars on his version of the spider, for example. And everybody spends millions of dollars on special effects. In those days, we would spend $500 for something done in rubber. So we got this young chap, who was a young actor, and we heard that he was good at this work, so we hired him to build the suit for the three-eyed monster. And we kept asking him, is it ready? And he'd say, no, it isn't ready. And, and we're getting really uh, sort of frantic because the day of the shooting comes and he says he's going to bring it down. We have our seven-foot big uh, man there, the three-eyed monster, ready to put on the suit. And we discover that this young fellow who's five foot three has built the suit to, to fit himself. There is no way in the world you're going to get it on that seven foot guy. So here we have a heroine who's supposed to be carried who must have weighed 40 pounds more than he did. And the problem was, how do you do it? We put the suit on Blaisdell, that was his name. And by means of having different people holding different parts of the girl out of the camera, and I'm going to tell you, it was tough. We managed to get our shots and we made, you know, the day the world ended. So this is where I say ingenuity has always worked better than cash. And frankly, uh, in this day of 30 and 40 and 50 million dollar pictures, a little more ingenuity might be very helpful. One of the pictures that came after that that Roger did was it conquered the world. This was also an original idea which has also been copied. In this one, a being comes from another world. Apparently the world is being depleted of female stock. That is their planet. And he's come down, I guess, either to carry away semen or, or girls, one or the other. In any event, he's down and he has a means by which he ejects little spears that embed themselves in the brain of the local townspeople and will do his bidding. And not a new idea now, but it was a new idea at that time. But the monster itself, or the being from the other planet, sort of looked like a, oh, I don't know if it's a tomato or some sort of thing of that kind. <laughs> See, another one of Blaisdell's, you know, outfits. So we released a picture in the United States, and it was really quite successful. Now we send it over to England, where you had a censor at that time, a man by the name of Trevelyan, a very interesting man, I might add with a rather sly sense of humor. Anyway, we don't hear from him. We're wondering what rating would we get. We still don't hear from him. We were making pictures in the UK at that time. So I finally came over and went to see Trevelyan. I said, I said, Mr. Trevelyan, what's the problem? He says, well, we don't know whether we're going to let this picture into the country. I said, my God, what is there about this picture? He said, this monster is that a human being or is it an animal? And I'm trying to figure out what devil the difference made. And then I realized that the English have always been very kind toward animals. <laughs> I'm, and so I said to him, well, of course, this is a human being. He says, it doesn't look like a human being. I said, but it's a human being in accordance with that particular planet. So he passed the picture. <laughs> picture was successful. Sam, there's, um, there's always been a sense of uh, uh, a circus and uh, not, not only in and, and sensationalism, not only within the films themselves, but in the way you've marketed to them. Um, how, how far is this a result of your attraction to the whole aspect of carnival? I mean, there's, there's a great showmanship about the way these films were made. Well, we really didn't have much in the beginning except showmanship or or exploitation, which is a perfectly honorable word, but has become rather dishonorable over the years for various reasons. You know, 
I, in my own opinion, Jaws was an exploitation picture. But because it cost so much, uh, and it was the shark that was the exploitation, it, it, it wasn't called exploitation. You're, you have pictures that come out now that cost 20, 30, 40 million dollars. Oddly enough, they're exploitation pictures in many cases. But it's, it seems to be that only these cheaper pictures, these pictures done for less money, are called exploitation. Fundamentally, we had these problems. We didn't have any stars. We couldn't afford stars. We didn't want them, really. We didn't have best-selling authors. We didn't have plays. We didn't have anything in these pictures except fundamentally title, artwork, and a concept. And we had to sell the concept. And that basically was why it was a carnival business as far as we were concerned. And with all due respect to all the auteurs, to all the directors who take themselves so seriously, it's still fundamentally a carnival picture. At least the general run of pictures are carnival pictures. I'm not denying that there's an Ingemar Bergman. I'm not denying the young Fellini. I'm not denying that there are some directors who are deserving of the designation auteur. But in general, this is still a carnival business. And the bigger the carnival, the bigger the amount of advertising that goes out with it. That's fundamentally the whole thing. Yes. I refuse to take, look, I've enjoyed this business, I've had a good time at it, but I refuse to take myself completely seriously. Uh, and I think anybody in the picture <coughs> business who doesn't recognize the carnival aspects is being a horse's ass, fundamentally. <laughs> If somebody had asked you when you were studying at the University of Iowa that uh, in 10 years from now you'll be making exploitation pictures, what would you have said? Well, that's a good point. It so happened when I was at the University of Iowa, I uh, was a little on the arty-farty side, <laughs> which is young people are wont to be, and there were a number of New Yorkers that I associated with, and we didn't go to see domestic films. We only went to see on Wednesday of every week one of the theaters in Iowa City would show a foreign film. And we didn't want to go to see a film unless the lovers sank to the sands as the cameras panned at the skies. But necessity, you know, breeds its own. And 10 years later, it, uh, we did what we had to do. And I must tell you, I liked it. And I still like it. So that's really the explanation on that factor. There are, of course, a great many pundits in our business, there are a great many journalists, you know, who talk very learnedly, and I'm always amused when somebody comes up and says to me, why did you do this particular shot this way? Just like they do. Now, a serious auteur will give a reason for every shot. In point of fact, I don't know of a single picture that's ever been made that was ever made exactly the way it was diagrammed. Why? Because some shots don't, just don't come out. Sometimes, even with all the takes you take, the, the actor's response doesn't work. And somehow, in the cutting, the picture is changed. Now, the fact is, that's a normal process. But we still have these learned folk, you know, who will search for hidden meanings in the pictures. Picture is what it is. Um, Roger also, talking about Roger, we did 13 Edgar Allan Poe pictures with Vincent Price, with Peter Lorre, all but one with Vincent, Peter Lorre and a number of them, Boris Karloff and a number of them, Basil Rathbone. We did the last six, I believe, over here. We also used Peter Cushing uh, and other English ones. The thing about the, the Poe's was that Poe actually never wrote a full novel in his life. We had to take normally 10 or 20 pages and turn it into a full script, which I thought we were quite successful in doing. I remember the first time that we ever held a uh, reception after any picture, and this is after we'd been in business maybe for oh, seven or eight years, was on the first poll picture in the United States for House of Usher, and we were surprised and rather delighted when the journalist said, you were very faithful to the book. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, we, we made about six of them over here. Uh, 
One of them was, Roger made about six or seven of them, and then he didn't want to make any more Poe's, so we use other directors. There was one director here that I thought would have become one of the great directors. His name was Michael Reeves. He was a young man with, I thought, tremendous talent. He had a book. He approached us with a book, which was very successful over here, called The Witchfinder General. It was a story uh, about witch finders uh, during the, uh, whose administration was it at the? Cromwell, yes. Cromwell, <coughs> thank you. Uh, now, he wanted to do the picture. Nobody else in England wanted to do the picture, although the book was quite successful. Nobody could see how you could turn it into a picture. We liked him, we liked his concept, but we knew we could not sell it in the United States you know, because uh, they didn't know from Cromwell over there. Uh, and which finder, witches they knew about, but which finders they didn't know about. So as a consequence, we had no alternative, uh, and we were running short of available Poe stories that would work. So we found a Poe poem, The Conqueror Worm. And we had so we said, okay, we'll call this picture the Witchfinder General in the UK, and we'll call it the Conqueror Worm in the United States. So we had Vincent for the United States and other territories read this poem to begin the peace with, and we, we didn't, of course, include that in England. Picture was a success in both places under the different title. It did, however, lead to a problem. Uh, and that, um, it was EMI, had the rights, had the distribution rights in the UK, and they also, of course, had as a natural part the right to all the military, naval camps, and so on and so forth around the world of the British. So I think it was Singapore where they played uh, the Witchfinder General on the base, or the naval depot, whatever it was. And so a group apparently came and saw it there, and then it played under license directly to theaters uh, about a month later under the name of the Conqueror Worm in the city. And a number of uh, naval men, fairly well soused up, who had apparently seen the Witchfinder General on the base, came to see the Conqueror Worm. Now, they really weren't all there, but they finally began to realize by the time you got to the third reel <laughs> that this was the same picture they'd seen under a different title. And uh, needless to say, it causes uh, quite some conflict and I guess a little theatrical theater damage before it finally got evicted. But I did make sure that they got their ticket costs back. <laughs> One of my more benevolent, benevolent acts. When you brought uh, Vincent Price to uh, England, for uh, the, uh, the Poe films, um, he was um, he was uh, asking for extra expenses, I believe, living expenses. Well, when we brought yes, when we when we brought him over here, we we made this was, this was probably in the mid '60s, and I think we gave him five hundred dollars a week for expenses, which was a lot of money over here at that time. Uh, and then, after a couple pictures over here. He said he wanted $1,000 a week, uh, and, I, and I thought to myself, um, knowing, having been over here, I didn't really think it was necessary that he lived so lavishly as that, that he could do very well for $500. So it so happened I was over here and had the script for the next picture, and I called him up and told him I had it. He said, uh, here you're going to the airport, will you drop in on the way to the airport and give me the script? So I got into the car and the chauffeur drove into one of the poorest sections of London I've ever seen. I'd never been back in that area. I don't know exactly where it was, but it was really shabby. I go into this shabby hotel. I cannot believe Vincent's living here. And I ask the, uh, the clerk, I said, does Vincent Price live here? He said, yes. And I called Vincent on the phone. He says, come right up. And I come up. Uh, these stairs. I don't even believe it had an elevator. And there is Vincent in a shabby room. And I look around. I say, Vincent, 
what are you doing here? He says, uh, uh, you don't even have your own bathroom. Uh, he says, well, you don't go to the toilet much. <laughs> I said, but you're getting 500 a week and you want 1,000. I said, why? He says, I'm buying art. <laughs> there he was. You know, he was a great art collector, a great, uh, he used to buy all the art for Sears Roebuck, a big national chain of stores. He also was a great cook. Vincent was a completely superior individual. But he had his idiosyncrasies too, like we all do. Uh, after Roger, of course, was the first, we gradually built up sort of an AIP group that sort of hung around because we did listen to everybody. Uh, young people came to us. How do you think we got all these young directors? I used to give lectures at all the film schools. There were three of them in Los Angeles. Uh, and you would find out who were the promising students. Um, Francis Coppola, of course, went to UCLA in Los Angeles. And he came to work as an assistant. We bought a couple of Russian pictures. And he took out all the propaganda and left the special effects and then reshot the rest of it. And we sold those directly to television. Then he became an assistant director. And ultimately, we gave him his chance uh, to direct a picture, which was Dementia 13, which was shot in Ireland for something like about $50,000. Francis is a very capable director. Scorsese was another. Uh, Scorsese did a student film at New York University called Mean Streets. It was just a short student film. We saw it and we decided that we wanted Scorsese to direct uh, a picture we were making, Boxcar Bertha. Now, it might sound strange to you, Scorsese, who was born on Mulberry Street in New York and grew up in an area uh, where there were gangsters, Italian area where there were lots of gangsters, and which he was accustomed to. I don't think Scorsese had ever been west of the Hudson River up to that time. We were shooting the picture in northwest Arkansas, and we hired a lot of hillbillies, really, to do extra work, uh, all kinds of work, and not for very much money. Roger happened to be the producer of it, so you can understand <laughs> why. And Roger went off one day, and these Arkansas hillbillies decided they weren't getting enough money, and they kicked all of the crew out of the bar that they were shooting in and proceeded to drink up the bar. And they were holding poor little Scorsese hostage. They weren't going to let it loose of him until they got more money. Finally, by the end of the day, we got the whole thing cleared up over the telephone and they released Scorsese. And Scor as Scorsese tells it, he was so happy to get back to Mulberry Street and the kind of gangsters he knew. <laughs> but Scorsese is really a great director. Uh, he re received some honors uh, recently, and I uh, spoke then. And I have a great regard for Scorsese. He is a pure director. Um, so is Francis, but Francis does sometimes pick strange subjects to work with. Uh, besides uh, that, Woody Allen. Now, Woody Allen was a comedy writer when I first met him for the Show of Shows, which was a Sid Caesar show in the middle 60s. And ultimately, he got to the point where they would let him appear in a few comedy bits on the show. And he was ambitious, and he and uh, a producer, Frank, uh, uh, Sap Hank Saperstein came and what Woody wanted to do was to take a Japanese spy picture which he had seen and he wanted to strip all the dialogue off of it and put his own dialogue in, his own comedy dialogue and that's what we finally agreed although everybody in the organization except Jim and I thought it would never work because it was a completely new idea uh, and he did it and in a sense, the organization was right, but in another sense, they were wrong. We went out with a picture, and nobody understood it. I mean, they liked it, but nobody thought it was worth paying money for because of the peculiar form of it. And it really wasn't until because of this picture 
Woody got his chances at some bigger budget pictures and became successful, that we were able to tag on this particular picture and it became a success. It played uh, with anthologies and so on and so forth. Woody, of course, a man of some substantial talents also. There have really been a uh, great many others uh, he worked with uh, David Cronenberger, too, on Shivers, I believe. Yes. Had you seen Stereo and Crimes of the Future? Which one? <laughs> Stereo and Crimes of the Future, which were his short films I think he made earlier. I don't think so. Mm. Cronenberg is a very good director. Uh, actually, I met him through Ivan Reitman, who has done some big pictures like Ghostbusters, who uh, showed us his first picture, which was called Carnival Girls, which he made for virtually nothing in Canada. And we acquired it, and then we made a number of pictures with Ivan. Uh, and he was the one who brought uh, Cronenberg to see me. And we made this picture, little picture, Shivers, which was really the first one that Cronenberg did. Uh, these are all very talented people who really never had an opportunity before that and wouldn't have had an opportunity because of the fact that the major companies would never take a chance on subject matter of the kind they dealt with or let alone with them either. Uh, John Milius uh, came to us from SC Film School and he worked for us for $75 a week doing about everything and he finally, he was a great writer in a sense for great parts. He could write a great part and he finally got to the point after about a year with us, well, he worked on a number of pictures, but didn't direct any. Uh, and he wrote a picture, uh, The Law West of the Pecos, that starred Paul Newman, had a great role for Paul Newman. And so Paul Newman acquired it. And then uh, Mountain Man, I believe it was, with Robert Redford, also a great part. But nobody would give uh, Milius a chance at directing a picture so we had an idea that we wanted to do a picture on John Dillinger, the gangster. And so we called up Milius uh, and said, look, if you write a good script, we'll let you direct. So Milius immediately called his agent. And the agent said, OK, you can have uh, a script to, from him, but it'll cost you $250,000, and it'll cost $250,000 for you to direct. I said, my God, we're giving this man his chance to direct. We'll give him $25,000 to write it, and we'll give him $25,000 to direct it, and a piece. Actually, as it turned out, he made more from his piece than he would have you know, if we paid him without a percentage. But Milius is very talented also. There were, of course, then the actors. Uh, Jack Nicholson did about eight pictures for us. Jack Nicholson is a very intelligent man. Uh, and a very talented one. He's been a little spoiled in recent years by all the accolades uh, that he's gotten. Uh, he wrote, as a matter of fact, The Trip, uh, which was a picture about LSD that had uh, Peter Fonda, Nancy Sinatra, Bruce Dern, and so on, uh, which was a very good effort. Peter Fonda also did a lot of pictures for us. Cher uh, did, a, did her first picture, actually. It was a picture called Chastity. And this goes way back to, I think, 1969 or 1970. She was really very young. Uh, her husband directed her in the picture. Um, Robert De Niro uh, got his start in Boxcar Bertha, which was a story about Ma Barker. Uh, and so on. Uh, and our very own Joan Collins, I believe, was... Uh, oh, yeah. Now, Joan Collins didn't start with us, but Joan Collins has, has many different show business lives as a cat. And one time when she was down, uh, she came and she said she would like to do a picture for us. And that was, see, what was the name of that picture? It was something about an ant. <laughs> Empire of the Ants? Empire of the Ants. Now, in this particular picture, which was a sci-fi picture, uh, we had giant ants, and ultimately at the end, 
uh, they eat her up. <laughs> I was on uh, the Letterman show a couple of times, and Letterman had heard about this, and he asked me if I could bring some footage of her being devoured by the ants, because he said that was a plight most desired by many people. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, the Screen Actors Guild had passed a resolution that said unless it was for straight advertising purposes that you had to get consent of the uh, actor-actress. And Joan uh, said that she was above that at that particular time. So that great feat, not accomplished by anybody else in the history of filmdom as far as I know, of being eaten by a giant ant, will perhaps go to its grave Although, when it plays on television, it'll be there. Charles Bronson also uh, came to you and, uh, with Machine Gun Kelly, and yeah. I believe that you've got plans afoot to... Yeah, Charlie Bronson appeared for us in a supporting role, uh, and then when we decided to do um, Machine Gun Kelly, uh, we gave him the role. Uh, the whole picture was made for $100,000, and Charlie got $5,000, most he'd ever earned. He was delighted to get it. We are now, my son and I, are now making another version of Machine Gun Kelly, a much bigger picture. Uh, it's going to be made for Columbia, and it's going to cost approximately $22 million. Uh, of course, inflation has operated. It hasn't operated in that ratio. But making a picture for a major company uh, is, of course, different than making a picture as an independent, which is how I made these 500 pictures. Um, I ran into Charlie a few months ago, and he said, Sam, he said, I hear you're making Machine Gun Kelly over again. Uh, are you going to cast me as Machine Gun Kelly? I said, no. I said, Charlie, you're too old. He said, well, Sam, you're older than I am. I said, yes, but I'm the producer, you're the actor. You know, producers can be any age, as long as they can breathe. <laughs> I said, however, if we can find a writer to write in a part for Machine Gun Kelly's father, I'll let you play it at the same price. He declined. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, as it is now, we've had some, of course, we couldn't make $100,000 pictures forever. We've in, in these years, the prices gradually came up. Uh, we made pictures like uh, the Dracula spoof, Love at First Bite, uh, which was a big success all over the world. Uh, Dress to Kill, which was Brian De Palma's uh, picture. Brian had done his first horror picture for us called Sisters, oh, 15 or more years before that and Amityville Horror, which was the largest independently uh, made and distributed picture uh, ever made, that by independence anyway, until a year before last when Ninja, Teenage Ninja, Mutant, Mutant. whatever it was, came Thanks. along and beat it. Although, uh, well, the inflationary gesture, they're pretty much the same receipts. In any event, uh, we're going to run this other... Uh... Not yet. I think we'll uh, wait for some... We'll have some questions from the audience in a minute, Sam. But I wonder if you would... Uh, I know you have some very uh, specific thoughts as to <clears throat> the uh, rise in costs of film production um, related to the percentages that are being given away. I wonder if you would care to share well, those with us. I, I don't think the motion picture industry is going to vanish. Far from it. If anything, people want to see more entertainment than ever. And with the inventions of, of course, television came in, was first of the part of the electronic revolution. But since that time, we've had home video, we've had cable, we have satellites, and we're soon to see uh, satellite operation that will offer us 50 or more pictures uh, for some form of pay. So the industry is not going to disappear. This is not like the horse and buggy when the automobile was invented. Then there was really relatively need, little need for uh, the horse and buggy. 
But what is going to happen, in my opinion, is this constant increasing spiral of costs is going to uh, have a dire effect. Pictures just can't, pictures are chancy at best. Uh, it's all very well when you hear big grosses for big pictures, but there are pictures that fall on their backside. And I'll w give you several from last Christmas that were both very expensive pictures that really died a death, even though they had stars in them. One of them was Havana with Robert Redford, who at least used to be a big star. This was supposed to be another version of Casablanca. The only trouble was you didn't like anybody in it. You liked everybody in Casablanca, even the villain. You have, that's the first rule of making a picture. Who the devil do you like? Who the devil do you follow? If you don't like anybody, you're not gonna like the picture. Havana grossed in the United States $15 million, which did not pay for the prints and advertising. The picture must have cost at least $50 million, and there were several people like Redford who got gross profit participations. That just isn't going to work. At the same time, there was a successful book in the United States, which was quite good, and you rather liked the people. It was called Bonfire of the Vanities. Has that been printed in uh, the UK? Mm -hmm. The big success in the United States, and they had three stars in it. Uh, in fact, Brian De Palma was the director also, I might add. But it had the girl from Working Girl. Melanie Griffith. Right, Melanie Griffith. It had uh, the fellow that you could never dislike, Tom Hanks. Hanks. And it had the chap from Moonlighting. Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis, okay. Three giant stars, all of whom probably had some kind of a percentage from the gross. See? Now here's a picture. Here's, here's a book that was well liked, and characters were well liked. But the trouble is, once it gets into the maws of a major company, all the people around in the production department want to get their hands in it. They want to change it. They want to be able to say, I had something to do with making this picture. And by the time they were done, you didn't like anybody in the whole picture. You had three giant stars, a giant director, and a successful book. You didn't like anybody. The picture grossed also $15 million, which didn't pay either for the prints and advertising. On the other hand, take, let's take three pictures that were not expected to be real big, that didn't cost anything like what these others had cost, say $50 million. Uh, one of them is Home Alone. I don't know how big Home, I think Home Alone was quite a, a sizable gross in the UK. It is now about the fourth or third biggest picture ever made. I'm delighted to say, you know, as a self-conscious but admiring uh, father-in-law, that my, uh, our son-in-law, Joe Roth, is the man who took the picture away from uh, Warner Brothers and brought it over to Fox, where he is the chairman. Uh, Warner Brothers had spent a certain amount of money on it. It had no stars. They developed it, though. They put all their money into it. They developed it. And then it came down to the point, and the director said, I need $18 million in the budget. And Warner's, which had been overspending, now all of a sudden does what, you know, an overspender always does. He cuts off the money. He says, Warner said, 16 million is all you get. Joe Roth rushed in, put up the 18 million dollars, and got the picture. The, the same thing happened with Edward Scissorhands, as a matter of fact, also with Warner's, which Joe rushed in and got. That was not one. The other two pictures that did so well were the gypsy, not the gypsy, the ghost. Ghost. Was it ghost? ghost? Yeah. Oh. Now here's a picture that was not expensive. Also was an enormous grocer. You liked everybody in it. It's important. You've got to follow people. If you don't like them, you don't give a damn. You know, uh, Hollywood and even in the UK and the picture business got all kinds of kinky individuals, all various kinds of kinks. And the biggest kink of all is ego. And they insist on changing pictures, building them up, and so on and so forth. Actually, what the public wants to do are simple, generic things. They want to laugh. 
they want to cry, they want to be scared. That's really what they want. So, and the third picture that didn't cost much, about $12 million, teenage, ninja, mutant, whatever, uh, was liked by all the kids. So there you had two giant pictures that really flopped and three pictures, all of which came out more or less the same time. So that's, there's really a lesson there somewhere. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people in the production departments in big companies who really don't understand the past. They don't know anything much about the past of, of movies. And as Santa Ana once said, if you ignore the past, you're going to make the same mistakes over again. He didn't put it quite that way, but that's what he said. 